Director Elia Kazan so far has never let me down. Uh, I'd seen four films previously of his that were all just gold as far as films of, of the period they came out go. Uh, one of his movies is my all-time favourite. Uh, it's my favourite film of the 50s, On the Waterfront, which also won Best Picture. This film, Gentleman's Agreement, also won Best Picture. Question is, did it deserve it? And is it as good as his other films that I've seen? The answer to both of those questions is yes. So the film follows this reporter, Philip Green, played by Gregory Peck, who goes undercover for a news agency that he works for as a Jew. Now, this film was made in 1947, uh, so, obviously, with the influx of Jewish immigrants after the Second World War, you did get quite a lot of anti-Semitism. Um, and I'm sure there is a lot of other political stuff that I can't even begin to understand because of just sheer ignorance, quite frankly, that fed into that anti-Semitism. But the fact of the matter is, this was a period in which anti-Semitism was quite rife. It's a story that... I'd apparently, you know, if, if you listen to the characters in the film, many people have touched on it. Uh, it's, so the, the character finds it a bit of a dull story. He's like, yeah, I, I don't really want to do this story. It's like it's been done before. So in order to spice things up, he's trying to look for an angle. How can I best do it? How can I, how can I make it even remotely interesting? And he decides to pretend to be a Jew. Uh, the, the paper that he goes to work for doing this story, nobody really knows him there. So when he arrives, he, he gives himself a Jewish name. He lets people, you know, make the implication that he is Jewish. And when they do, he confirms it and basically witnesses the reaction to his Jewishness across the board from all different walks of society, mostly upper middle class society. And I think that's uh, one of the criticisms that some would level at the film is that it, you know, it, it only looks at the a certain class of society. What about the, the lower classes that are affected? To me, I wouldn't level that criticism at the film because I, I think there's room there to make a film about that. It doesn't bother me that this film doesn't concern itself with that because it's still doing a lot to deal with, um, you know, a certain aspect of this. Whole thing. Like, for example, there is a scene in which he goes to this hotel, this, this club. He goes to this, like, like a social club kind of thing. He wants to book a room and stuff. And the room's all booked. And then when he gets there, he decides to let it slip that he's Jewish. And it's then that they say, oh, actually, sorry, sir, you're, we made an error. You're, there, are, there are no rooms available. And they basically turf him out. I read a criticism somewhere about how um, the film is dealing with the people who, who get through the door. You know, the, the richer people, the upper middle class people. And, and the, the, the real problems are... What about the people who can't even get through the door of the club because they're so obviously Jewish? And, and it's just, it's a really, it's a non-critique for me that. It's the people that are in power, it's the people who are privileged, that have the ability to, 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 to speak out, to have a voice, to, you know, who, who control the media, who control the narrative. They are the people that, that need to see this stuff that need to kind of take a different tack on it and, and relate to it. And that's what the film is concerned with. You know, we're talking about Elia Kazam. This is a, a man who was ostracized as a communist. You know, he, they, they went after him uh, for, you know, d during the communist witch trial. He's concerned with prejudices and, and the results of those prejudices. And uh, I, I just, yeah, this film does a wonderful job of, of showing us those prejudices through this man, uh, through the the woman that he kind of falls in love with. Um, and I just, I think it does an amazing job of showing how even those who, here's the thing, 
it's really relevant today. You watch this film today, and if you've never seen it, if you've never even heard of it, I, I swear, if you watch it, given our current climate, given the level of anti-Semitism that is currently going on in the world, you watch this now, and it will show you something that I think will hit a nerve. It feels very relevant to me. There are certain characters in this that speak out against anti-Semitism. They're, you know, they're very much, they want to be seen to be against it. It's what today we would call virtue signaling. But when it comes to acting, when it comes to a point where actually they're, they're confronted with a choice that will mean being ostracized by their own people for, for speaking out, for taking action, then that virtue signaling kind of falls apart. And I feel that, yeah, we see that rife today. Um, and I just, it, it just re it really spoke to me, it really hit me. I, th I just found the film to be really engaging. Um, people that, and again, it's, it's non-judgmental as well. So those people who do virtue signal, again, today, I think we would, you know, we, we, we use the label of virtue signaling as this, as this thing to like bring people down and criticize and say that, like, you know, you, you're just as bad as the other side and this, that, and the other. And I think that's one of the, the, the downsides of, of having a label like virtue signaler. You know, I think it, it's, it's handy in being able to make a point about something, but it can also be used as a label to, 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 to really drag someone down. And I think what this film does is, is, is it highlights that element of our nature, of everyone's nature, to, to want a virtue signal, to want to, to want to be seen to do the right thing, um, but to, to point out that actually doing the right thing requires doing not just saying it requires action and and that's what this film is about and, and at, the, at the center of it at the heart of it is this man who when it comes down to it is willing to do the right thing he's willing to speak out he's really he's willing to make choices in front of people that would judge him that are right for the sake of being right rather than being with the in crowd there's characters as well that Today, I think if, if this film was made today, so the ending of the film um, is quite interesting because that whole virtue signaling that I was talking about, there's a particular character that does that. And I think because of that today, they, they once, once they're pushed away and they kind of are in this film, once they're pushed away, it'd be that's it, they'd be gone and done. And the, and the person who wasn't virtue signaling, they'd be brought in and, and the two characters would, would have a happy ending. Whereas what this film does is it, it gets to grips with that virtue signaling and it finds a place for redemption. It finds room for redemption, for growth in certain characters. And so like me as, a, as an audience member, I was almost sitting there hoping that this guy would leave this woman and go with this one. And it doesn't go that way, and instead it, it goes it goes different ways. Um, that, like I say, are unexpected because of where I think it would a film of today would take it, a Hollywood film of today would take it a, a different tack on it. I think. Um, so yeah, it's brilliantly written. The dialogue is fantastic. Um, the I can't remember the name of the actor that plays this man's son, but. Yeah, he, he so he has this son. He's he's a single dad. So that that's that in itself is something that it's quite you know it's not something you see a lot of in films of this time. You know, like Hollywood. When I think single dads in Hollywood movies, uh, I, I I think that the first thing I go to is Kramer versus Kramer. Um, but no, yeah, you got this guy as a single dad. I, I think he lost his wife. I think his wife died or, or something like that. Yeah, I think his wife died. Um, so he's bringing up his son with, with help from his mum. That relationship there between him and his son, I find to be quite genuine. I find really good. And, and I, I like the way that the, son, the son's questions challenge him because that's what kids are like. You know, having two kids of my own, 
kids cut straight to it. They, they, they cut through all the BS. They don't do your political dancing. A kid just says something and they say it out loud. And if they have a question, they say it out loud. And if you're in a public place, you can be quite embarrassed by it, uh, to be perfectly honest. But that's, that's what I love about kids, uh, is they cut straight to the heart of the matter. And, that, and I think they do a good job of that here. I find a lot of kids in movies of this era, and um, to be honest, any era pre the early 2000s, child actors were often quite grating. Um, uh, here, I, I do find this actor to be pretty effective. And, and I think Gregory Peck coupled with him, uh, and, and even Gregory Peck, an actor that I've not seen much of his work, only a handful of his films, but he's never really grabbed me, to be honest. Cape Fear, The Omen, I, I, I know his reputation as this great actor, but in, even in those two films, I was like, yeah, all right, he's, he's fine, but you know, I, I, I don't remember his, his presence in those films once, once I've finished watching them. Um, I think I even said that in my review for The Omen. But, uh, but here, no, I, I, he's got a real presence. Um, he's got what this character needs, which is this backbone. You get the sense of this, you know, this, this moral fiber that this guy has, that this character needs. And I think Peck really instills this character with that. Um, and like I say, the, the relationship he has with his son feels real to me, feels genuine. Um, if I had one criticism, I would say that uh, because they are trying to cover so many different aspects of anti-Semitism and, and how it manifests and the ways in which it presents itself and all that kind of stuff, um, and, and, and you know the, 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 the moral perspective on various angles from it, they're trying to cram a lot in, and sometimes that does result in maybe conversations that don't feel quite as natural as others. Uh, like there's one, there's there's one at the beginning when the son asks the father a question. They're looking at this statue, and he asks him this question, and it just comes out of nowhere. And and then Peck's character like starts to go into this like almost. Well, that, that was clearly a bit of exposition. We needed that information to set up where these characters are at and, and for, for the rest of the journey. So it feels a little bit like shoehorned in there in, a, in, a, in an unnatural way, just to tell us a few things about where this character is coming from, where he's at, where his mindset is. And, you know, it's a minor criticism in what is otherwise a really well-written film with, with, with great dialogue, uh, fantastic story and as I say something that if you watch it now which I did it holds up have you seen gentlemen's agreement and if so what did you think about it please leave your comments down below thank you for watching this video and until next time cracking